Okay, um, let me welcome you all again uh, to the Levy Institute. Um, as Pavlina said in her remarks, we are looking forward to two days of exciting conversations and debate and discussions. Uh, we are starting with a session titled uh, Dollar Hegemony and uh, Debt Crisis. And we are starting with a uh, look at uh, the external problem of Africa, a continent that's been failed persistently by the multilateral financial institutions and has transferred a lot of wealth to the rest of the world. Um, so the first speaker is uh, Ndongo Silla of Ideas and uh, the talk is uh, titled Rethinking African External Debt Problem and m and Perspective. Mr. Silla. Thank you very much uh, for this invitation. I'm very grateful to uh, Pavina Chaneva Economic Democracy Initiative and the Levy Institute for their uh, invitation. Uh, my presentation is about rethinking African external debt problem and MMT uh, perspective. So I will share with you my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Um, so, uh, my presentation is about uh, other ways we could think about African external debt problem, uh, and namely uh, using the MMT lens to try to understand it uh, dif differently. My, my, my perspective is about how we could uh, create uh, economic progress at the periphery while you know, uh, achieving significant progress uh, you know, at the level of the world economy in terms, for example, of reforming the international financial system and other aspects of, of, of the world economy. I believe that there are things that we could do despite all these structures of economic and financial dependency. And I will try to um, illustrate that using an MMT perspective. So when it comes to addressing Global South debt crisis, uh, among the domin dominant policy recommendations from most economists, heterodox and mainstream, and policy makers is, for example, facilitating better external financing terms and conditions, for example, conditional finance rather than market finance, grants, etc. There is also the idea of setting up a functional international sovereign debt restructuring mechanism that ideally dispenses with austerity policies. Also, this approach is promising. It has so far failed to deliver convincing results uh, due to the bias of rich countries towards the status quo. As uh, scholar Christina Laskaridis uh, showed in her work, since the 1960s at the UNCTAD, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the efforts by developing countries to propose resolutions and betterment to the situation were repeatedly refused by creditor nations. Uh, so it seems to me unlikely that the status quo will change anytime soon. Uh, the global North countries will not accept a genuine reform of the international financial system anytime soon. If that scenario were to happen, we would have already seen some signs in that direction. But what we have been witnessing is more worrying because uh, the global, global North could have done many things, for example, uh, providing extent, extensive debt relief because the global South countries, the global North countries can afford that. Uh, as MMT allows us to understand that uh, monetary sovereign countries such as the US, Japan, the UK, etc., have no intrinsic financial constraint in their own currency. In principle, they can afford to facilitate the cancellation in part or in whole of low and moderate income countries' external debts. Uh, so providing debt relief or cancellation is not an affordability issue uh, for them. It's a political one. And this is something that MMT allows us to understand. Uh, in this slide, for example, you could see that in 2021, the PPG, public and public guaranteed external debt of the low and moderate income countries is 134 countries. If you accept China, Russia, and India, their external PPPG debt in 2021 amounted to 2.6 US dollar trillion, which is less than the federal debt stock of Germany that same year. The external debt service of these countries amounted to 300 billion in 2021, and a figure to be compared with the 18 trillion US dollar of debt issued by the OECD governments in 2020. If you take the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, 46 countries, their uh, public external debt went from 161 billion in 2010 to 471 billion in 2021. 
the share of euro bond holders because there have been this trend to uh, issue uh, debts in for, uh, in uh, denominated in foreign currency on the markets. Uh, it went from 20% to 31%. Uh, if we exclude the seven biggest sub-Saharan African economies, their external public debt service went from 76 billion US dollar to 202 billion during this period. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, external debt service went from 10 billion in 2010 to 43 billion in 2021. If we exclude the seven biggest uh, seven South uh, Sub-Saharan African economies, their external public debt service went from 2.9 billion to 15 billion during this period. These are very small amounts. To, I mean, from the perspective of the global economy, and the global North countries could have easily uh, cancelled this debt, or you know. <clears throat> erase it a substantial part of it yet they are not doing that they are doing countless uh meetings to try to so-called restructure the you know the debt of the global south so if global north countries are not motivated to provide significant debt relief to the poorest countries in the world why should we expect that they will accept a reform of the international financial system uh, so in contrast to this dominant approach that focuses on the reform of the international financial system, which I advocate despite my pessimism about its feasibility in the short run. I would like to suggest a complementary approach inspired by modern money theory, MMT, which I believe is much more impactful in the long run. Uh, to solve the global South's recurrent external debt problem, there is no alternative to my point of view to achieving more economic and monetary sovereignty. Uh, to put an end to the recurring debt crisis, global South countries should try to limit their issuance of sovereign debts in foreign currencies, as these are not always justified from a purely economic point of view. Indeed, uh, the major weakness of most debates and policy proposals about global South debt is that they often assume that it is normal for the governments to issue debts denominated in foreign currencies. Yet, I argue that any discussion on the external debt problem of the global South must start with what I call the MMT question. And the MMT question is why should, why do governments in the global south issue debts denominated in foreign currencies? As we will see, when we try to unpack this basic but very realistic question, we come up with interesting findings that allow us to think differently about the external debt problem of the global south. From my own investigation of the economic literature, uh, there appears to be four uh, main answers to the MMT question. There are two valid ones, uh, one that is false and one that is superficial. Uh, the first valid one is political dependence. Uh, many countries of the global south inherited so-called odious debts at the time of their access to independence. And the payment of these debts constrained their development and installed them in a vicious circle. And we could quote here the Belgian Congo, former Zaire, and Haiti. And I think these countries uh, maybe are entitled to reparations for that. There is a very prominent view, uh, the lack of money and savings view. Uh, this view has been dominant since you know, the emergence of the international community, uh, international community of development after World War II. And it is uh, you know, the lack of money, lack of savings. And we know that this is false. Uh, there is a valid one, another valid one is the MMT response. Uh, technical material dependence on foreign real resources sold in foreign currency units is a, a sufficient reason to issue debt in foreign currency, but it is not always a necessary reason, and we will sh show why. There's a superficial one shared by the mainstream post Canadians and as heterodox, is this idea of foreign ex uh, lack of foreign exchange or balance of payment constraints. It's a superficial, and I will try to show it uh, using an MMT-informed balance of payment analysis. Uh, this concept of external uh, constraint to me confuses at least three analytically distinct issues, dependency vis-a-vis -vis foreign real resources, an international payment problem, and uh, political economic considerations. I will start with the first one, uh, dependency vis-a-vis -vis foreign real resources. As no country is self-sufficient in every domain, all countries have a real resource constraint, global north or global south. All countries need to obtain imports from the world economy. To this extent, all countries face a foreign real resource constraint. But the degree of national resource self-sufficiency or dependency varies across countries. 
the richest countries are more self-sufficient for at least two reasons. They are able to control real resources at home and uh, thanks to their transnational companies, real resources abroad. Another reason is that they can also buy foreign real resources in their own currencies with limited impact on the stability of their exchange rate and domestic inflation. This leads to the second problem. Most countries of the global south face an international payment problem. They generally need to have access to hard currencies, let's say the US dollar, to buy their imports. For countries that are resource rich, the payment problem is easily circumvented because they generally manage to obtain export earnings beyond their import needs. By contrast, for countries that are resource poor or that are not able to generate external earnings to cover their non-FDI imports, FDI is foreign direct investment. And I think that the case of uh, imports financed by foreign direct investment should be always treated differently. Uh, for these resource poor countries, the international payment problem can become a transfer problem. Uh, the deficit of foreign exchange could lead to a depreciation of, the, depreciation of the exchange rate, which increases the domestic currency burden of the foreign debt and might lead to imported inflation. Because they can't buy foreign resources in their own currency or without generating undesirable macroeconomic outcomes, resource poor countries face a double constraint. They are import dependent and they generally do not have enough foreign earnings to buy their critical import needs and service as uh, international payments. The most binding constraint here is the domestic real resource constraint. It's not the international payment one. It would be erroneous to call this a balance of payment constraints because these countries just do not have the capacity to develop economically based on their own domestic resources or domestic creativity. Maybe these countries should benefit from unconditional transfers from the rest of the world or join more economically viable political entities. This being said, one way resource poor and resource rich countries alike can alleviate the international payment problem is through economic diplomacy. They could try to rearrange their trade towards countries that accept to provide swap lines or to trade in domestic currencies. In this slide, you could see that nearly half of cross-border commercial payments from Africa are invoiced in US dollar. It's a left-hand side image. Yet North America receives only 10% of these commercial payments. And you could see that in the right-hand side image. Uh, given its growing trade ties with Africa, China is experimenting alternatives to the dollar system with African countries, such as commercial swap lines. The point here is that the international payment problem is not necessarily a rigid constraint. Countries could on a bilateral or multilateral basis circumvent the need to trade in hard currencies if such is their wish. Let's recap. The concept of external constraint in the current academic usage not only conflates the foreign real resource constraint and the international payment problem, it also wrongly portrays as a balance of payment constraint the situation of countries that simply does not have real resources needed to support their development in the long run. If a country is highly import dependent in many critical areas and also objectively too poor to be able to generate the foreign earnings or remittance from abroad that help, him help it finance its imports, this country does not have a balance of payment problems. This country is resource constrained. What is perceived as a balance of payment constraint is actually a real resource constraint. The concept of external constraint also erroneously includes realities that are more the results of domestic political economic considerations than the perceived defects of the international financial system. Let me detail quickly four aspects of what I call domestic political economic considerations. First, any domestic decision or policy that weakens the usual export earning capacity of the national economy all else being equal will play negatively on the capacity to acquire foreign real resources. Second, any domestic decision or policy that weakens the domestic share of export revenues, all else being equal, will play negatively on the capacity to acquire foreign real resources. For example, if government decides to nationalize the export sector or does not receive a fair share of export earnings or can't control the export sector, they allow a significant share of their real resources to be transferred abroad and they deprive themselves of foreign earnings that could have helped them acquire foreign goods and stabilize their exchange rate. I will give some example of this later on. Third, any domestic decision or policy that leads to artificial import dependency in some critical areas, all else being equal, will tend to increase the demand for foreign currency. For example, many African countries uh, were relatively food self-sufficient in the 1980s. With trade liberalization imposed by the World Bank and the WTO World Trade Organization, 
they became import dependent in, on, in food. This demand for foreign currency to buy food imports can't be labeled as an intrinsic external constraint. It is the outcome of domestic policy choices that can be removed. Fourth, any domestic decision or policy that leads to non-necessary foreign exchange use will increase the demand for foreign currency. I would say that many infrastructure projects implemented in Africa during the last two decades can be labeled Ponzi projects to the extent that they are subject to the so-called currency mismatch. Governments take debts in foreign currency to finance projects which only generate income in domestic currency and which do not necessarily boost the export sector earning prospects. In the case of these Ponzi projects, governments have to find sources of foreign finance external to these projects in order first to service the debt contracted to finance them and to allow for the conversion and repatriation of profits made in local currency. Generally, these Ponzi projects are implemented within the framework of so-called public-private partnerships, PPPs. These PPPs often involve what Daniela Gabor called de-risking practices, for example, guaranteeing a minimum demand to private enterprises implementing them. One general point here is that when the PPP de-risking approach is generalized to sectors for which domestic real resources exist and which do not generate foreign earnings like internal transportation, health, education, it will create more foreign currency debts and contingent liabilities for governments and a surge in dispensable income transfers to abroad. So the concept of external constraint often erroneously refers to the accumulated result of all these examples of inappropriate domestic policy decisions. All of this discussion leads me to one point. No reform of the international financial system can be a panacea when the basic national framework for progressive economic and industrial policy is absent. Recurrent debt crisis in many global South countries, especially those that are resource rich, is first of all a symptom of a lack of fiscal and technical control over real domestic resources, and also a symptom of inappropriate or even unsustainable allocative choices. And I will briefly illustrate that with the case of African countries, because what is significant about African countries in that from the beginning of the 2000s, they had uh, debt reliefs, substantial debt reliefs. They also benefited from commodity booms, a super cycle of commodity boom, and yet Two or three years after the end of the surface commodity bull, they were in debt distress. So what happened during this period where most mainstream economists were calling about Af was talking about Africa rising? I would say based from aggregate data that two kinds of things happened. First, a significant part of the foreign earnings was captured by multinational companies operating in their export sector through income transfers and resource theft. Second, with a global liquidity glut that fl followed the great financial crisis, the governments, African governments, carelessly issued euro bonds offering high yields to finance Ponzi projects and service the existing debts. Some of these projects, some of these governments subscribe to the desking practices uh, described by Daniela Gabor, and Ghana is a clear example. Ghana defaulted on its debt, uh, you know, two years ago. Here, uh, you could see, you know, some data about, you know, uh, primary income on FDI, foreign debt investment. These are the returns on FDI, on its, let's say, profits uh, and dividends. And you, it's, it's in blue. And you could see uh, the external debt service, public external debt service, it's in orange. And you could see total interest payment for 30 African countries representing 75% of the GDP of the continent. And you could see that starting with the commodity boom, 2005, 2006, uh, the primary income on FDI increased a lot, much more than the external debt service. In 2018, it was 50 billion US dollar of external debt service and 50 billion dollars of FDI income. From a development economist perspective, the thing is why this country should not capture this, you know, uh, FDI income to reinvest that, you know, in critical sectors like, for example, agriculture, energy. Etc. But generally, people do not talk about you know these uh, income transfers from transnational companies, and yet the average rate of you know of returns. I tried to calculate that you know uh, in the mid 2000s. 
are really shocking. For example, for 26 countries, the average return was something like 77% in Botswana to 6% in Gambia. These returns are higher than the returns, you know, the yields on the African uh, government's uh, debt in, in, in foreign currencies. Yet people would not talk about this. And this is for me, one of the roots of the African debt problem. Uh, here you have the same uh, information for two countries that defaulted on their debts, Ghana and Zambia. You could see that during the last two decades, 2000 to 2020, uh, the primary income in Ghana and Zambia was higher than the debt service and also higher than the interest payment on the, on the external debt. And the case of Zambia is interesting because uh, Zambia is going through a debt crisis, but this debt, debt crisis was created by the way the previous Zambian debt crisis was handled by the IMF and the World Bank, because what they did uh, in the late 1990s is that they obliged uh, Zambia to sell off and privatize its copper assets for the benefit of Canadian companies. And the Canadian mining asset in Zambia were worth something like 9.4 billion US dollar or equivalent to half its entire GDP. And uh, the Canadian government secured an agreement that gave a former vice president of the Bank of Canada the role of governor of the Bank of Zambia. And uh, this uh, central banker was supposed to oversee the country's Zambia's monetary policies and so-called response to the IMF. The foreign mining companies uh, negotiated ultra low royalty rates and the right to take the government to international arbitration if tax exemption were withdrawn for 15 years or more. Many of the multinationals made their investment back in a year or two. And when the price of copper rose five fold in the mid 2000s, they made huge profits. And during this period, between 2000 and 2007, Zambia exported more than 12 billion in copper, but the government only collected uh, 246 million in tax. That means 2% of the copper export income. And uh, this explains, according to the research by development economist Andrew Fisher, why the debt relief provided to Zambia in 2005 relieved much of the burden of interest payment on debt, but remittances of profits earned from foreign debt investment rose rapidly at the same time, more than counteracting the income effects of debt relief. As a result, the primary income account deficit actually increased following debt relief, reaching 10% of GDP by 2007. This pattern explains why Zambia benefited little from the commodity boom in terms of mobility, mobili mobilizing foreign exchange for its development efforts, even uh, considering the contributions of aid. And uh, this is the, you know, the so-called uh, licit part of it. But there is also the so-called illicit part of it. That means the resource theft. And the resource theft have been measured by some economists. For example, for Zambia, what they call illicit financial flows, real resource theft between 1970 and 1991 uh, was estimated at 10.6 billion US dollar, 355% of Zambian GDP. Between 2001 and 2010, 8.8 .8 billion US dollar, according to global financial integrity. Between 2013 and 2015, in the midst of the uh, copper boom, 12.5 billion US dollar of resource theft, according to Jungtat. By comparison, Zambian PPG external debt stock amounted to 1.2 billion US dollar in, two, in 2010 and 12.5 billion US dollar in 2021. My point is that Zambia, Zambian government should never have issued debt in foreign currencies is Zambia is the Zambian government was able to control its export sector because this country is resource rich. It's an anomaly that this country is going through debt crisis because it has enough domestic resources to, uh, you know, to avoid to issue debt in foreign currencies. And you could see that, interestingly, the year when Zambia defaulted on, on its debt, uh, 2021, in fact, the interest payment, uh, external interest payment in the, in the income account was less than 4%, but the overall income deficit were more than 12%. That means that the uh, uh, dividend remittances, uh, income remittances, profit remittances by transnational companies, to, to some extent, you know, captured most of the exchange rate, makes a foreign, foreign, foreign exchange. And yet people would say, you have yeah. rest, rest, restructured that. Uh, this is my ultimate slide. Uh, ca captured. Um, they would talk about restructuring the foreign debt, but they would never include in that discussion the role played by transnational corporations in you know, stealing these resources, but also in appropriating most of their foreign, foreign exchange. So while waiting for a significant reform of the international financial system, which is needed but not sufficient, African countries could do four things to increase their economic and monetary sovereignty. 
That means to reduce the need to issue debt in foreign currency. As most of them are resource rich, if they manage to achieve more technical and fiscal control over the export sectors, they could increase their ability to finance their imports out of their foreign earnings with less need to issue debt in foreign currency. They could try to ease the international payment problem through economic diplomacy, swap lines, possibly to trade in domestic currencies, etc. If they rely for their economic development on real resources that are available domestically or that they could develop domestically, this will expand their policy space. They should also be cautious and selective about Ponzi projects. And by that, I mean projects that are subject to currency mismatch. When they seem uh, to be economically important, strategic, concessional forms of finance should be privileged while avoiding their risking commitments for the behalf of transnational cooperation and private global finance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Silla, for that uh, insightful presentation, reminding us that uh, uh, cancellation of external debt, although fashionable, is not really a panacea for the development problems and questions about the development model and the use of real resources. And uh, as uh, Pavlina mentioned, the democratic and the control for it, for a just transition, is much more important also. Right? Both, both are important. So our uh, next speaker is Karina Lima, University of Leeds. Uh, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I, uh, I will talk about uh, how monetary power affects uh, and uh, influences the vulnerability to sovereign debt crisis. And uh, I'll focus on uh, some uh, legal and institutional matters that, that uh, we could consider to, uh, even though uh, a structural reform of the international monetary system would be necessary, uh, I'm here assuming that there are certain constraints politically at this time to, to undertake such structural reform. So I'm advocating for uh, a legal framework that, that will help mitigate those asymmetries at an international level. So just, just to uh, kind of summarize the takeaways here, uh, I um, argue that sovereign debt crises are not solely produced by episodic misfortunes or, or mismanagement as conventionally um, highlighted or, or advocated in the sovereign debt literature in general, but they arise from structural asymmetries in the international monetary system. Uh, and so because uh, those are structural symmetries, we should definitely uh, elevate those issues to the center stage of global policy debates concerning appropriate mechanisms to deal with sovereign debt crisis, because they are not um, episodical or, or extraordinary. They are uh, systemic uh, to the international monetary system. And so uh, based on that, um, I will advocate for an international legal framework that, that uh, will uh, make sovereign debt restructurings more effective and, and also equitable based on principles of good governance and also informed by established uh, practices in cooperative law. So uh, an outline here, I'll basically explain monetary power in my, in my own interpretation of it, uh, a little bit of how the post Bretton Woods systems, system creates the uh, vulnerabilities to sovereign debt, debt crisis to the monetary periphery, uh, and why this is so, and then a little bit about sovereign debt restructuring today and why we need a binding proceeding to um, undertake sovereign debt restructurings, and some guiding principles, just uh, kind of put, you know, just to uh, start the discussion. Uh, so what do I mean by, by monetary power? Basically, uh, it's the intersection of monetary sovereignty and currency hierarchy. So monetary sovereignty is not defined in international law. Uh, just to, uh, something I forgot to mention, I'm a lawyer, so, uh, you know, bear with me. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to kind of, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interdisciplinary debate, so. This is not defined in international law, but it's traditionally recognized by public international law and, and case law. So it, 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 it basically includes several legal prerogatives of a state, like for example, issuing, issuing currency, but also setting interest and exchange rates, et cetera. So there are several prerogatives here. I'm, I'm focusing particularly in a state's capacity to issue debt in its own currency, uh, but uh, acknowledging that there are other factors like uh, Donga was, was mentioning uh, uh, in his own words. Um, this is traditionally construed as an absolute concept because uh, law understands that sovereigns are equal um, in, in public international law. So 
it, it, there is this idea that that uh, all sovereigns are, uh, should be able to exercise monetary sovereignty, but but as uh, scholars in this room and beyond have noted, uh, this is a spectrum. So it means that countries in 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 practice can exercise varied degrees of monetary sovereignty. In um, and uh, but of course, as Pavlina mentioned earlier, that that there is room, there is policy room to expand. Uh, but crucially, this policy room is constrained by currency hierarchy, right? So there is policy room for monetary sovereignty, but there is only so much you can do uh, based on how much your currency performs or fulfills the, the functions of, of money at an international level. So um, that means unit of account, medium exchange, and store of value, right? So currency hierarchy is a, a well-established concept uh, that I, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with uh, because it's very much present in Anglo-American and also Latin American in international political economy. But uh, being a lawyer for me, this is uh, important because it is largely overlooked by uh, legal scholarships and practitioners. So we don't know, uh, we, we, we lack a systematic understanding of how currency hierarchy affects the, the, the capacity, the legal institutional frameworks of a state. Um, for me, I understand this at two basic levels. At a contractual level, it's the, it's the money of unit, the, the unit of account and payment of contracts, understanding international trade and finance as a network of contracts, but also it's about the central bank's foreign reserves and the legal and institutional frameworks that govern uh, that that uh, connection because it, uh, because that it depends on how much a central bank holds in assets that are denominated in different current currencies and at, at an aggregate level, uh, this will create a currency hierarchy at an international level. To what extent a currency performs the functions of money at an international level? So monetary power is this interaction. So there is, uh, there are policy, there is policy room to expand a, a, a state's monetary power, but at the same time, there are structural constraints that uh, exist because it depends on how much it, its own currency will perform the functions of money at an international level. Uh, good. So uh, let's have a look at the post Bretton Woods system. Um, and two basic features here, I think, are important when it comes to vulnerability to sovereign debt crisis. One is uh, we have uh, we've moved to a fiduciary dollar standard, right? So there is no more uh, uh, the, the PEG system doesn't uh, uh, operate anymore. Uh, and in practice, at, in the international monetary system, this has generated a hierarchical system where currencies have asymmetric levels of international liquidity. Uh, the top currency being the U.S. dollar. We have some core currencies that hold uh, intermediate levels of liquidity which are reserve currencies as well, the IMF reserve currencies. But then we have peripheral currencies that uh, work as financial assets, but not this is not as money at an international level. Uh, and uh, we have a trend towards capital account liberalization, which has been encoded in law as well. Of course, the uh, OECD's uh, capital uh, account uh, liberalization code uh, the IMF in its policies uh, have, has uh, encouraged that, and, 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 and to a certain extent, that's the, the standard uh, the, from which countries should uh, are, are expected to operate. That liberalization reinforces uh, that asymmetric system because it uh, creates a pro-cyclical um, effect in the monetary periphery, meaning that in times of instability and crisis, typically money will flow from those contracts denominated in those assets and those jurisdictions, uh, and they therefore increase volatility in times of crisis. So those two factors create vulnerabilities. You, you can see here, uh, I know those graphs, uh, you know, the, the, you can't um, see very much here, but it's just to illustrate instability, right? We, we have four, well, that was before the COVID crisis. Uh, it's a it's a graph from 2019, but you will see that, well, the COVID crisis also uh, triggered another um, episode of volatility since the 1970s. That That is the post Bretton Woods system. And that creates, that has crucial effects in terms of creating vulnerability and sovereign debt crisis in the monetary periphery. So uh, here, uh, I think 
based on the idea of monetary power, we, we, we should be able to understand that sovereign debt markets behave in many respects like other credit markets. They are hierarchical because uh, they have, uh, they, they are hierarchically structured around currencies. They are inherently hybrid because of course money and debt, this is public debt. So there are public considerations involved, but also there are, there are private uh, technologies and infrastructures involved and functionings, and they suffer regularly from liquidity stress, which is something that, that any other uh, uh, financial market will also, uh, will, will also have, uh, it's a problem that will also have, uh, any other financial market will have. So there is, in, um, uh, uh, there are structural vulnerabilities involved in, um, peripheral currency states debt because uh, first monetary power here will affect their fiscal capacity and what I mean here is that uh, capacity of the state to collect and allocate fiscal resources uh, will be impacted by uh, both in monetary sovereignty of course if it's in a foreign currency but also the, the hierarchy of the currency because um, uh, that, that a peripheral currency uh, state will be exposed to exchange rate, in, rate instability created by those liquidities fluctuations, uh, international liquidity fluctuations, and that will jeopardize the fiscal capacity of the state. Uh, then also um, we have, uh, because liquidity is cyclical, that will create issues in terms of being able to roll over sovereign debt. So it's not about repaying, right? We have this kind of this uh, idea that sovereign debt is repaid, uh, but actually, this is a, uh, it's basically a rollover kind of mechanism. So constrained access to liquidity will also uh, create problems to roll over those, uh, those uh, monetary obligations. And uh, finally, uh, there are um, issues and, and, and asymmetries in terms of accessing the global financial safety net. So in terms of su suppressing liquidity crisis by accessing international sources of liquidity. Uh, I won't have time to go through this in detail, but the Global Financial Safety Net has four crucial mechanisms for reserves. This I will exclude a little bit because it's not necessarily an international uh, source. It's the state itself. Uh, uh, that, that we, we have its own foreign reserve. So I'll focus a little bit on the currency swaps, regional financial arrangements, and IMF, IMF financing uh, without um, overburdening you with details. But here, basically what we see is that there is a significant, uh, there are significant um, uh, inequalities in terms of accessing the um, bilateral currency uh, swaps. Uh, and uh, so here, let me just, yeah, so um, I will, yeah, I'll go here, this one will. So uh, these are public international arrangements, right, where governments uh, will, will, um, will be able to access international liquidity. They serve to improve market liquidity. Uh, and uh, as you can see, that there are the, the network of, of, of currency swaps uh, covers several different uh, overlapping, overlapping swap networks, but uh, the, the Fed network is pretty much, it covers pretty much the uh, countries that have core currencies or in, in extraordinary circumstances and, and within limits, some peripheral currency countries. Uh, here you will see that, uh, that um, we have uh, basically the uh, diff different uh, types of, of, of uh, access to the global financial safety net. Uh, but um, the key takeaway I would like to uh, you to have here is that even though the uh, IMF financing and swaps may have uh, similar uh, functionality in terms of, 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 of addressing liquidity crisis, the, the, the circumstances in, and, and the conditions under which countries will access those two types of liquidities are completely different because of course, swap arrangements, especially if, if you have an unlimited and, and uh, type of swap arrangement are unconditional. 
sources of liquidity, so they are not subject to conditionalities, whereas IMF financing will come associated with heavy conditionalities, and they are limited in in, in terms of, of, of how, uh, there is a, a real constraint in terms of how much you can obtain. So that 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 th those asymmetric conditions of access to international liquidity also reinforce uh, monetary asymmetries, monetary power uh, inequalities. Um, so summing up here, uh, the monetary periphery is structurally more vulnerable to sovereign insolvency for reasons that fly beyond a state's fiscal framework, and th that it relates to asymmetric levels of monetary power. Those asymmetries should be central in our discussions about how we should deal with sovereign debt crisis. Uh, another factor I won't have much, uh, I won't have time to elaborate much, but is that uh, you will have, uh, as I mentioned here, uh, one of the mechanisms uh, of the global safety net are foreign reserves, and they are the most significant ones, as you can see in the, the, the blue uh, part of this graph. Uh, and, and, and basically, that's a buffer from financial volatility that peripheral currency states have been accumulated since the early, early 2000s. And the idea here is that they should be able to suppress liquidity crisis by intervening themselves in the foreign exchange market, because IMF financing, again, is heavily conditional. So they want to avoid that. that. But this exercise of self-insurance has uh structural effects as well because they entail a transfer of wealth away from the monetary periphery and 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 also um that they constrain uh the investment opportunities and, and ability of, of of those jurisdictions because they are holding those massive amount of reserves and not being able to use them to invest in infrastructure and uh and, and mitigating inequality so we have um so basically just to uh, kind of just move into the, the, the third and last part of this presentation, uh, based on the idea that these are structural matters, uh, they should be part of a conversation about how we deal with those crises today. Today, what we see is we have a transactional legal framework for sovereign debt restructuring. These are ad hoc arrangements where the state will have to uh, to negotiate with a broadening pool of creditors. There are no binding mechanisms. Uh, beyond contractual provisions, like, for example, collective action clauses to bind those uh, uh, creditors. And there is no established procedural framework. So we have the Paris Club, uh, that these are official bilateral creditors, but also uh, official creditors beyond the Paris Club, most notably China, uh, but also India, Saudi Arabia. We have private creditors, bondholders, and syndicated lenders. Uh, there is an increasingly blurry line here because uh, because uh, the contractual framework of some of the official creditors and the private creditor is very similar. Uh, but uh, to, but, but uh, also MDBs, uh, there is a discussion to what extent they should be part of, of sovereign debt restructuring. I won't get into this right now. But uh, that's complemented by IMF finances. This is a fragmented kind of framework. There are persistent trends here. Uh, that and, and evolving challenges. Creditor diversification. This is a you know it's been around for 30 years, honestly, because diversification here means incre an increasing amount of bondholders, uh, marketable debt, but also now different types of bilateral creditors. So China gaining more relevance as a creditor. Lending practices diversification, meaning we've moved from syndicated loans to bonds in the 80s. But now we are moving back to syndicated loans or, or official loans again, uh, because China has this uh, practice of, of lending. Uh, and, and, and the problem here persisting is that uh, uh, those processes are often uh, result in too little uh, in terms of that relief. So insufficient that relief and very significant delays in the process. Um, those coordination and enforcement challenges are, are exacerbated by creditor diversification. As you can see here, Ch uh, China has become a more significant creditor, but also uh, private creditors have increased in, in time, right? In, in terms of that their, significant, their significance. So it's not only, uh, I see a lot of conversations now about how, Ch how China kind of um, poses, you know, uh, challenges and, 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 uh, um, jeopardizes the process, but but uh, of, of that relief. But actually, 
there is a problem of, also about uh, private creditors because there are no binding mechanisms to ensure that they will abide by the terms of uh, restructuring uh, provided by official creditors. So uh, I, 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 I was planning to discuss the Chad example, but here, uh, just bear in mind, uh, Chad is an example where uh, Glencore was one of the most significant, one, a third of, of Chad's debt was basically uh, that this is a commodity trader. China was not a significant creditor there. And still, uh, Chad, there was a significant delay in the negotiation that was a recent restructuring, and Chad achieved no debt relief at all. So it's not about only China, it's about uh, it's about diversification and the, and the collective action problems posed by diversification. So uh, we need a binding proceeding. Um, the, the voluntary arrangement based on gentlemen's, agree gentlemen's agreements that were uh, upon which sovereign debt restructuring was based until the 60s cannot, doesn't work anymore because there are strong incentives to for creditors to hold out and delay free riding on the debt relief. Um, we need an, uh, an established procedure uh, to because there are there there is a lack of consensus on on on, on basic rules like comparability of treatment or, and other substantive rules. Uh, and uh, those lessons must inform a legal framework that embeds good governance principles to forge a proceeding that is flexible enough to adapt to, the, to different sovereign debt restructuring cases. Um, some guiding principles here uh, I, I, I would suggest Good governance, you know, this is not a radical um, proposal at all. It's the basic rules of capitalism that, that basically govern the restructuring of any commercial entity should apply here because states and, and even the legal framework of sovereign debt has moved increasingly to the, the, to the, um, to the area and, and, and to the governing principles of commercial law. Uh, for example, notably, for example, the, the, the issue of sovereign immunity, right? States can be sued as commercial entities. So let's apply the principles of commercial law to that in the same way that companies can restructure their debt. So uh, we should apply uh, principles of good governance, uh, transparency, efficiency, equity, the rule of law. And there are some lessons from comparative law that are um, in so free insolvency mechanisms used to restructure corporate debt. So we should respect uh, sovereign authority to initiate the proceedings. Uh, all types of debt should be in principle um, eligible, uh, perhaps with some basic rule for priori prioritizing less resort lenders, some minimum social and investment thresholds, but uh, here, sovereigns uh, should retain the flexibility to design their restructuring plans, uh, choosing which debts they, they, they would like to restructure, how to categorize creditor classes in, a, in an initial proposal, and that should be controlled. The reasonableness of the offer should be controlled by a body, a decision-making body, a court that, that uh, evaluates the reasonableness of the plan, the class composition proposals, convening the meetings and the approval of the plan, just like corporate debt works today. Uh, there should be cram down provisions, that means uh, uh, binding creditors to participate, uh, dissenting creditors and also cross um, class cram down, where in certain cases, just, for, just like it works in corporate law, and a moratorium here would be needed to prevent a race to the bottom and further instability. Uh, so these are kind of just some initial thoughts, you know, uh, for for discussion. Um, and uh, and uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karina, for uh, highlighting the mechanisms behind the reproduction of uh, monetary power relations in the global system and also for bringing a perspective from law, which is uh, often you know, underrepresented, I should say, in our MMT conversation. Uh, both of them, both, I mean, Silla and uh, Karina highlighted the political aspects of uh, monetary relations and international monetary relations. Um, I guess our next speaker, Mona Ali, from uh, Sony New Pauls is jumping right into that. Jumping right <laughs> in. <laughs> that oh, that's what I do. Um, 
Uh, Camila, I think uh, we're in conversation. We've learned from one another. I've learned from so many people in this room. Daniela, Lara, Pavlina, and Nathan, I don't see you. Nathan is out hanging outside. Uh, and Rohan, of course. And all of you have been so helpful uh, in um, deepening my understanding of these issues. Um, so I feel this is a conversation with uh, all of you. Uh, very happy to be in the MMT zone. Um, and I think there are all these uh, intersections in the way that we think. Um, so I want to talk today about the global dollar system. Um, and Pavlina invited me on the basis of the weaponization arguments. I feel a little bit of pressure to talk about weaponization, although I wasn't really intending to do that. But I think I'll slide that in. <laughs> so I want to just uh, have you guys look at my... Uh, chart here, but I want to continue the conversation. So this is just a, a sense of uh, dollar dominance, or um, which is at the top uh, row, but then you have the share of the United States in um, equity markets, fixed income markets, oil and gas supply, last year boon for the hydrocarbon dollar, uh, and then you have other areas in which the United States dominates, in, including the global sanctions regime. Um, you know, uh, the data has become even more disturbing since uh, from 1950 to 2016, the United States uh, unilateral sanctions comprise 42% of all global sanctions. And now uh, since 2019, that's moved to an entire 53%. Um, global arms exports, uh, global military spending, no surprise there. And so we talk about the transnational dimensions of US power. Um, and so I think it's best to understand the dollar in a, as an expression, if you will, uh, of that uh, overwhelming sovereign power. Um, so I want to move away, actually, from a currency approach to thinking about financial power. That's a theme that I've sort of thought about, uh, you know, through various research into balance of payments. Um, so what does it mean to think about the dollar as a system? And I think we learned that from the Bank for International Settlements, fantastic work on understanding the dollar system as a matrix of balance sheets, right? And then we have uh, folks like uh, Stefan Morau's work, thinking about uh, the dollar as a credit driven in that way, similar to MMT, a closed system where assets must be matched by liabilities. But I want to interject a political economy approach. So thinking about the dollar as a matrix of monetary, uh, legal, and possibly military dominance. Um, and if we're in an era of new dollar dominance, I've said this in an article uh, it's called Regime Change, um, perhaps we should call it Bretton Woods Three, but differently from how um, others understand it. And I would argue it's the most weaponized form of the global dollar system yet. So I wanna uh, return to this idea of um, apex and periphery and the characteristic features and something that you talk about, Karina, of the global dollar system are the uh, elasticity of law and liquidity um, at the apex of the international monetary regime and the inelasticity of law and liquidity at the periphery. Uh, so three characteristics that we wanna think about, again, something that Karina's presentation picks up on as well, is a concentrated nature of the system, the opacity of the system, and the quintessential hybridity, a point she raised as well, of, of the system. Uh, so uh, by hybridity, we mean public-private. They're, they're combined. We see that crystallized in the politics of debt. So we can identify concentration and hybridity in terms of um, the interaction of banks and non-banks, right, NBFIs. Um, we're talking about folks like pension funds, the large asset managers, BlackRock, Vanguard, um, insurance companies. And those intersections, right, those uh, claims and liabilities across the borders, half of those tend to be dollar denominated, and the densest cross border linkages are Anglo American. So, um, New York, London, at the apex of the international monetary and legal hierarchy, um, almost half of the um, uh, foreign assets in the United Kingdom, financial sector, city of London, they're American owned. Uh, and London and New York comprise virtually the entire market globally from derivatives trading to asset management to capital raising. And the two hubs, of course, we know are entwined with uh, tax havens, uh, such as the Caymans. Um, most international debt securities tend to be issued in London and New York and governed by the legal uh, codes of the two jurisdictions. Uh, in terms of low-income economies, the external debt 
is denominated largely in English, uh, uh, the law of England and Wales. Um, so I wanted us to think about how financial uh, dominance plays out, and it plays out as a relative elasticity of the United States and the United Kingdom's balance of payments uh, sheets, um, as well as the fact that uh, in terms of the domestic uh, sheet, uh, balance, balance sheet, uh, while the sovereign debt issuance uh, doubled in the Eurozone and Japan post-2008, it quintupled the, the supply of treasuries and gifts. And that to me is a, just one more sign of that, um, the dominance of New York and London. Uh, I wanna talk about the foundation of the uh, global dollar system. And as we know, it's the US $25 trillion treasury market. Treasuries are benchmark collateral um, monetary instrument and the dominant form of dollar reserves held by central banks around the world. Um, there's a capacity to the treasury market more legal codes regulating equities in the United States than treasuries, than the market for US government debt. The prices of newly issued treasuries are not available to the public. Um, it's a hybrid system. Ensuring liquidity for the US treasury market is secured by the Fed through de the development of the treasury repo market. Uh, and the Fed has long buttressed liquidity in that market, more, more recently by making permanent its overnight repo and reverse repo facilities. Um, repo, by the way, and Daniela, we learned this from her fantastic work, is the plumbing of the global dollar system, right? Short-term uh, lending arrangements backed by treasuries collateral. The ultimate backstop, again, I'm not gonna spend time discussing this. We, many of us know this already, but that's the uh, swap line network, which has extended. So the New York Fed swap line network extended and very tiered, very hierarchical. So you see at the top um, here, uh, the dollar swap lines with the first tier central banks uh, that are unlimited and they're standing. And then you have post 2020, uh, we have new swap lines. In fact, it goes back to 2013 with a new tier. Um, and folks have called this differently. The Fed's own term, for this is the second tier temporary swap line uh, network. These are not uh, unlimited uh, dollar liquidity sources. They're actually limited to 30 or $60 uh, billion. Uh, and you know, so there the conditionality is attached to that. And then we we'll also see to the top right is the overnight um, FEMA repo facility, um, which is by the discretion uh, of the Fed um, to uh, take treasuries as collateral from foreign monetary authorities, central bank, and give uh, dollar liquidity in return. Um, and interestingly, there's a story there about who you ended up using it last year. Okay, so I um, I want to talk about last year. I guess I have to talk a little bit about the war. Russia's invasion of Ukraine resulted in the biggest uh, coordinated plurilateral economic counteroffensive that was unprecedented in scale. Um, G7 sanctions were rather targeted, but then they became uh, very uh, large scale and uh, all encompassing you know, in a sense. So they started off by targeting the two largest uh, Russian uh, banks while exempting Russian energy exports, but evolved into the blocking of Russian banks from the SWIFT network, the expulsion of Russian investment grade bonds from the three major bond market indices, and an import ban by the US and the UK on Russian oil before they compel the other G7 powers to join in. More than 10,000 sanctions uh, designations were placed on Russian entities. But of course, the most um, you know, striking element of the G7 uh, sanctions was the freezing of the 300 billion uh, in Russian foreign exchange reserves held uh, outside of uh, the country. Now, Russia had uh, slowly moved its uh, foreign exchange reserves away from the dollar, but the Russian private sector was very much entrenched in the global dollar system. Um, initially, interest payments by Russia on its dollar-denominated debt was allowed through a general license issued exempting um, the sanctions regime. Uh, but then the United States OFAC, which is the agency, which is the Office of Foreign Assets Control, let that sanctions uh, general license um, expire. Uh, and the, the EU imposed sanctions on Russia's national settlement depository, which effectively blocked Russia 
uh, from repaying its debt. And so about 100 million in debt repayments got stuck at Euroclear uh, in Belgium, which is the uh, Belgium-based securities uh, and depository and settlement house, which, uh, you know, uh, de facto defo uh, forced Russia into a once in a century default on its external debt. So as nations weaponized um, cross-border economic and energy infrastructures, global commodity prices, particularly for fuel and food, shot up, prompting central banks to raise interest rates. And so we saw the steepest inflationary hike since the 70s, which was followed by the Fed's most aggressive rate tightening since the 1980s. Uh, the dollar's appreciation, it was at a 20-year peak, was a result of the Fed's hiking cycle, and it compounded, as Karina mentioned earlier, uh, financial stress in a whole bunch uh, of uh, low and middle income economies who tend to borrow in dollars. So external public debt in low income and middle e uh, income economies is about 9 trillion. Uh, it's increasingly short term, half of the debt stock is in dollars. Bondholders make up about half of the stock of uh, low and middle income country debt. Now higher US treasury yields that we saw last year and have continued to a new peak this year uh, reduce, right? We know the inverse correlation between interest rates and prices of bonds. So as interest rates shot up on the treasury, uh, the prices of uh, US treasury uh, bonds uh, went down, uh, wreaking havoc on both private and public balance sheets across the globe. Now, of the 7 trillion plus in foreign owned US treasuries, 4 trillion are held by foreign central banks, big holders, uh, Japan and China. And the aggregate holdings, you know, valuation effects uh, lend themselves to a big uh, side downward um, of their holdings of treasury bonds. Now, I don't think it should be interpreted as de-dollarization. I'll talk about that in a bit. But it's a, a portfolio rebalancing in the case of China and Japan, where they were selling uh, and purchasing agency bonds instead. Um, I don't think either of them de-dollarized in any meaningful way. However, over the last year, uh, foreign central banks lost about 379 billion in uh, hard currency reserves. And that was more, uh, Lara's work has demonstrated this, this was more than what they received uh, in 2020 IMF's SDR issuance, which is about 210 billion, we learned from her work. Um, uh, Fed timing also wreaked havoc on uh, private balance sheets. Uh, and we know this case with Silicon Valley Bank and uh, so when that happened, this is March 2023, um, heavy losses on its book from mark to market treasuries and the Fed steps in and uh, Daniela called this a new collateral regime where for the first time ever, the United States Fed accepted uh, treasuries from SVB as, um, you know, uh, on par, right, uh, which was higher than their market value. Um, uninsured deposits, exceeding 250K were made whole for SVB and First Republic. And as the bond turmoil uh, spread uh, uh, across the transatlantic to Credit Suisse, um, echoes of the 2022 sterling crisis that I don't get into, although that was dealt with, uh, dealt with differently, the Fed reactivated its international dollar swap lines and the SNB quietly made use of that right hand FEMA repo facility. Yeah, that's fine. I don't have a lot of slides. The SNB um, arranged a public liquidity backstop for UBS, and um, the Swiss authorities uh, wrote new amendments into Swiss law to enable the merger of Credit Suisse, um, um, you know, uh, which was really kind of, um, I think, unprecedented, uh, although they're probably experts on Swiss law then myself. Um, so this elasticity in law and liquidity contrasts sharply with the rigidity and discipline enforced in IMF loan programs. Um, it's very time consuming for countries to uh, file an application and then to finally receive the loan. Um, the IMF itself takes its time. So the average length of time between a staff level loan agreement and the executive board's approval has increased from 55 to 187 days. The interest rate on the Fed swap facilities right there uh, was at about 25 basis points above the overnight index swap rate. Uh, the FEMA rate in 2021 was 25 basis points. But with the IMF, the extended fund facility, and this is just an example of what's going on, I'll talk about it in a second, 
the extended fund facility is uh, non-concessional. The bulk of IMF lending through its general resource account, non-concessional. Okay, that's about 85% uh, of IMF lending. All right, so just a small proportion of IMF lending is actually um, at concessional terms. So last year, IMF lending uh, peaked. This year, it was 127 billion in non-concessional and just 23 billion in concessional through the PRGT, the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. This is far, far below. It's about, um, you know, trillion dollar firepower, okay? Um, now, despite the claims made by the IMF and its leadership, the IMF is not at the center of the global uh, financial safety net. And I'm showing you my own uh, picture of this, um, which is the same as yours, uh, Karina. Uh, I, but here we are, uh, but yours was different, uh, standing at about 14 trillion. So on the left-hand side, absolute dollar amounts in trillions. On the right-hand side, as a share, um, the, the image to the left, the bar uh, chart here. Uh, so that's foreign exchange reserves aggregate on the left. Uh, foreign exchange reserves as it held by emerging and developing economies is a share of the total. That's the middle one. Um, so while bilateral uh, swap lines, regional facilities, um, IMF funding have expanded tenfold, they only amount to $4 trillion altogether. In the same period of time, uh, China's BRI uh, lending has really dwarfed IMF lending. Okay, we're talking about a trillion versus $150 billion. Um, Despite paying half of their public revenues right now uh, towards debt servicing, Egypt and Pakistan have chosen not to undergo debt restructuring, um, but they've expanded their reliance on China. Okay, that's been posting uh, dollars uh, and remedy into their uh, foreign exchange concerns. China now holds about a third of the external debt of low and middle uh, income economies. Um, finally, very quickly, I have two minutes. I want to talk about uh, this uh, gross uh, growth in sanctions policy. Um, there's been a 933% increase in OFAC sanctions from 2000s, war and terror 2001 to 2021. And it's become the tool of first resort as treasury officials say themselves uh, of their new economic statecraft that they're super excited about. Um, and they want to join the young bright things at Harvard Law School and uh, invite them to do that work for them. Uh, you know, So it's really a hybrid regime where sanctions and export controls you know, the folks who have to make sure that they work are private sector entities, okay? And so this has been a great boom, uh, the sanctions regime for tr uh, trade law regimes in Washington, D.C. Now, sanctions, in my view, are best not thought of as a substitute for war, but I think it's good to understand them, uh, at least I do, as war on the economic front, uh, as an escalation on the economic front, which may uh, spill over into other fronts. Um, and I want to have us recall those 300 billion of uh, Russian uh, exchange reserves stuck uh, overseas, 211 in Belgium, uh, 23 in Luxembourg. Now, Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act screeners, and I've talked about this in US and UK law, she sent me the uh, legal uh, doctrine. They articulate the immunity of central bank assets from asset seizure. And, you know, the US Treasury understands this. But the European Union has been pushing forward um, the idea to use the interest revenues on the stock reserves towards the reconstruction of Ukraine. Um, I want to very quickly leave you with two thoughts, which is, what do we mean by de-dollarization? I think it's best to understand that not as a shift away from dollars, but as a shrinking of dollar balance sheets. And how might that happen? Um, and here we can talk about, um, I don't think I'm, yeah. Um, we can talk about uh, what uh, banks have been doing last year, the largest increase, 70 billion, in gold purchases by central banks around the world. And then um, also half of all central banks are developing their own CBDCs. And all of this is coming uh, as a real frustration with the United States sanctions regime, uh, the G7 sanctions regime, and the um, 
decade-long retrenchment post the war on terror in Western correspondent banking networks as the sanctions regime uh, ratcheted up. So I've written more about these things uh, that you can look at, find uh, phenomenal worlds, which allowed me to publish this stuff. Um, Finally, I want to return to the theme of endogenous frailty. We've seen these ructions in the U.S. Treasury market, where we've seen post-2008 banking reforms limiting the capacity of primary dealers to house treasuries. So big players in the treasury market, hedge funds, um, high-frequency dealers, and they're creating a lot of um, volatility in the liquidity of the treasury market. And those spikes have led to that uh, repo facilities in 2021 uh, instituted by the Fed. And this illiquidity or diminishing liquidity in the Fed market uh, for treasuries, come, not the Fed market, the U.S. Treasury market, comes at a time when there's an incoming deluge of Treasury debt issuance because of structural budget uh, deficits. And so political over the U.S. debt ceiling, recurring threats of government shutdowns have tarnished the reputation of U.S. Treasuries as a risk-free asset. And lawyers... Uh, Minan and Younger, among others, have argued that ensuring that treasuries remain the world's most liquid asset class has become a um, central um, security concern. All right, thank you. 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 Thank Back to the beginning. All right. Um, I'm Kai Kornbrock. I'm uh, really pleased. Thank you for the invitation. I've just started at Bard College Berlin as professor of political economy in the politics department. So I'm really glad to, uh, as Mona also said, and yourself are also concerned to meet some of you who uh, only know from Twitter in person and also to engage very explicitly with the debate on MMT and the Global South, which I'm trying to do based on research I've been doing with the research group where we try to compare the uh, evolution and structural transformation in several West African countries since independence. And I myself have been doing the, the research on Senegal, uh, and I think it speaks to some of the issues that have been raised in all the three talks. Um, so the term earnest struggles, uh, as I, the title of the talk is Earnest Struggles, Structural Transformation, Government Finance and the Recurrence of Debt Crisis in Senegal. Why did I choose the term earnest struggles? Because um, in political science and political economy, there is a very strong tendency to pathologize African government action. So these African governments, they are all incapable and corrupt and they don't get anything done. So with this uh, choice of word, I'm just trying to indicate and underline rhetorically already that um, actually, no matter whether they were socialist, centrist, neoliberal, democratic, or authoritarian, most of them actually did try in earnest to structurally transform their economies. And the interplay between domestic political economy and global political economy go a long way in, um, in explaining why things didn't happen, but it's definitely not just corruption, which I try to undermine with that uh, choice of word. The structure of the talk, um, uh, sorry. Thing. Uh, so, as I said, I'm really glad to be engaging with the MMT discussion uh, explicitly here and progressive microfinance and macroeconomical discussions. What I'm trying to say in this talk, talk in five parts is that I have the impression that a debate on MMT in the global south has focused on money mostly so far. Um, but uh, to come to the real resources question, I will discuss some of the more recent useful work on monetary sovereignty. And I will argue that at the heart of the policy debate should be the exact relationship between making public money work for progressive ends and the real resources available. And in the fourth part, I'm tracing how Senegalese governments have struggled in earnest to alter the endowment with real resources. So overall, the talk will try to engage the relationship between money and real resources to try to make in the spirit of Pavlina's invitation to sketch some further avenues for research, how we could possibly think and it also relates a lot to what Ndongo has been saying. Governments should try to sort of control their fiscal space domestically also and focus on the real resources, how that could be thought of together and how that could be analyzed historically. So money and real resources. I, um, I've been teaching at Bard recently and we do all these really close classical readings and I've been really reading a lot of Marx. And I just, uh, from that comes this uh, basic point. I think that's worth an, uh, underlining this context. Mm -hmm that real resources are also commodities. They are not simply there, 
uh, apart from labor power, which also has to be reproduced, but they need to be produced, grown, and extracted. And for them to come into existence as commodities, uh, that requires money. So the continued relevance of this really famous uh, Marxian equation, money capital invested to, to produce commodities, to earn more money capital in the, in the process, I think is also sort of suggestive to that debate of the overall relationship to the real resources and, and money, because they are intertwined. Uh, they are not seen as something separate and they, and they don't exist naturally as, um, let's say, non-connected interdependent entities. So the MMT uh, debate um, in the Global South, I think I've picked a few um, famous or influential proponents here. I could have picked others. I would say that Ndongo and Fadel are sort of the most uh, visible and prominent scholars from the Global South arguing for the focus on real resources. We need to go beyond sort of the monetary focus. But in the academic debate, I think in the publication debate, for example, Nina and Bruno and John, uh, Joe, they have this article on monetary sovereignty as a spectrum. I think the debate is mostly on um, money and to what, to what extent sort of the external constraint means that you have to, as Nono was arguing, have to sort of indebt yourself in foreign currency. And the question of real resources is um, getting a bit lost in the process. And uh, I also, out of courtesy, I, I looked at your work, Pavlina, and I've seen uh, in your work on money, power, and monetary regimes, you have this really nice and useful graph on the different sort of uh, degrees of monetary sovereignty and what they, what they mean for um, policy space, which is an extremely uh, influential discussion in international political economy. There's lots of very good papers in RIVE and NPE on the notion of policy space. Uh, but I think it's not yet really engaging with, with the question of really uh, real resources. One thing that I would like to bring in, and I think it connects very nicely to what Mona and uh, Karina were already saying. I think you mentioned Stefan Mura already. I think this piece in perspective on politics is extremely useful. Rethinking monetary sovereignty, the global credit money system and the state. Uh, why is it useful? Because I think they make a very good point that we need to go beyond the state focus um, uh, currency, national public currency focused approach to monetary sovereignty. Because as they show in this graph here, you see, um, you know, this currency hierarchy pyramid idea is still there, public money at the top, then what they say, private public money. So these are private money forms that are publicly backstopped. And then we have the bulk of money creation, which is private money that is somehow only uh, sort of influenced by the state. And they have these different, these three different verbs to make sense of that hierarchy. So they can control public money, it can regulate private public money, and it only manages and sort of influences private money. And crucially, at the bottom, you have onshore and offshore. So all these monies, currencies, in their different public private hybrid forms, they are circulating worldwide. And we have to sort of make sense of that fact. I think it's a very um, important extension of the hybridity argument and with a view to, to what extent the state and public actors are involved. Okay, so that just on the, on the monetary side of um, the relation between money and real resources that I'm trying to, to analyze in this talk. So the reality in, in Senegal, so I'm, I'm moving towards the, the real resource part now. So Senegal at independence in 1960 was 80% um, dependent on peanut exports at the time. So classic extractivist uh, colonial economy, all the infrastructure led uh, towards uh, the ports. Uh, and at the same time, it was still using and still is using the colonial currency, uh, the franc CFA, which is a currency union with a regional kind of central bank, specific, extremely restrictive uh, arrangements that come with it. But over time, all these different governments have earnestly struggled to transform their economy and have managed to do so. So we have diversification of exports and funding sources. But one continuity that remains is that reliance on foreign finance and danger of debt crisis has remained. So I will give you a little bit of background to underline this perspective of earnest struggles on what these four uh, presidential regimes and Senegal is characterized by quite a degree of stability in terms of uh, political power, um, which maybe makes this analysis of earnest struggles a bit more straightforward because in the other countries that we're looking at, Ghana and Nigeria, for example, we've had a lot of military coups, a lot of instability, but that doesn't mean that they didn't try in earnest to structurally, uh, and they also did achieve that, transform the economies. But Senegal might lend itself uh, particularly well to that analysis. Uh, 
So her heuristically and based on sort of on interviews and, and aggregate data, interviews with decision makers, politicians from the different times, uh, I would suggest there are first there are three areas of earnest struggle. The first one is from independence to the onset of debt crisis, where they've attempted to um, overcome the dependence on peanuts and the dominance of French firms within the economy, which they achieved. So there was a very close uh, relationship with French capital and also French personnel was still staffing the ministries. And they managed to do that in the first 20 years. But then debt crisis hit and it was a sort of a, a defensive struggle uh, dealing with uh, structural adjustment imposed by the IMF. Uh, Senegal was also the first country worldwide in 1979 that had an IMF program with um, conditionalities. And then they had to deal in 1994 with a, an externally imposed that wasn't really desired by the participating governments of 50% devaluation of their currency. And since massive debt relief in 2004, you may have heard of the HIPIC initiative that was for most African countries a really large freeing of fiscal space because a lot of the debt was written off. Since then, we can sort of say there was an active and forward looking one to consolidate and expand Senegal into a middle income country on, uh, based on higher tax return and less debt repayment. So that's all, you know, broad brush. But I mean, in the paper where, which this part, historical part of the analysis is based on, I give a lot more evidence of what actually uh, happens uh, politically and economically. Here, this just to underline that this is the diversification of exports that Senegal governments over time from 1962 2020 achieved. So it's not very well visible for you, I think, I guess, but you, what you can see here is that we started with just peanuts in 1962, and at the end of the graph, we have six different export commodities. So what Ndongo is proposing, you know, governments have to sort of better control their export sectors. I think uh, a diversification of exports uh, for the for earning farm reserve is already a good step. So there's positive things that have been taking place notwithstanding the, the progressiveness of the, of the governments. Another thing that is, I think, uh, important to know um, that here you see the GDP per capita and debt service to GNI ratio. Um, so um, GDP per capita in 1960 was about similar than in 2014. So we only, only in 2013, people in Senegal had like higher GDP per capita income than um, at the end of colonialism. So we cannot really say, despite all these changes, that it was a massive sort of creation of wealth for the bread population. <laughs> Referring to the danger of debt crisis, you see this extremely volatile uh, line. We are now at a higher uh, debt service to GNI uh, ratio than ever before. So the crisis, the, the, the debt crisis, uh, the dependence on foreign finance that this is the basis of um, is potentially on the horizon. But I would say since some of, some of the structural uh, transformation has taken place and a diversification of funding um, has been achieved, this is actually not that clear whether Senegal and every African country in that situation will actually have a debt crisis. Um, here, just um, to, to underline uh, that Ernest struggles did achieve something. On the left, you see like the massive um, drop in public debt as with HIPIC initiative, freeing up a lot of fiscal space. Here you have, you have the, uh, the growth of the public budget, so the relative to GDP as well. So the government has managed to increase its fiscal space also by increasing its, its revenues. Here um, you have a, a share of tax revenues, which is also slowly but moderately growing. And this is the explosion at the bottom here of Eurobonds that in recent years, which also um, Dongo was referring to as a as a big danger. But what you can see here, um, so Senegal over the 63 years has managed to sort of diversify its, and increase its funding for governmental activities, has also managed to structurally to transform some of the export sector, um, which means that uh, not all is lost and that new attempts of uh, taking that further could be tried. So what does that mean for the MMT in the global South debate? So I would say, First of all, even within a currency union with utter lack of monetary sovereignty in the traditional sense, um, there was a diversification of funding sources that can be observed. S structural economic diversification was not I mean, fundamentally achieved, but a diversification of export happens. And um, even under massive monetary constraints and
own path the tendencies of corruption the endowment with real resources was um, transformed what potential for MMT does this offer so uh, coming back to that initial discussion we had the debate on monetary sovereignty and MMT is often falsely broken down to one on uh, just you know uh, bringing IOUs into circulation and uh, uh, that will obviously lead to, lead to inflation, but now we sort of have a more nuanced sense that real resources and their usage matter for the um, for the uh, kickoff of inflation, and then we just have a, um, uh, um, inflation constraint and other budget restraints. I think there's more nuance there. Uh, when we think about that uh, in southern countries, I think um, we have to think about how difficult it is in a colonial economy with colonial path tendencies. To, to transform the endowment with real resources, but it can be done and it was done in, um, in Senegal. But with a view to the financial system, uh, we would have to think really creatively, I think, about um, how to complement national currency systems with parallel currencies uh, or also how to structure our financial systems. Because in a system where we have public, private, public and private money forms, um, how domestic political economy and the domestic political financial system work in the interest of the majority of the people, I think is an extremely difficult, but potentially also rewarding uh, intellectual and policy change for us to maybe be developed further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kari. You are a model of discipline in terms of time. And, uh, I, really appreciate the, I really appreciate the in-depth view of Senegal's political economy and development in that Um We have uh, about, I think, half an hour or so left for a Q&A. So what I'd like to do is to first take a few questions, let the speakers respond, and then move to the next round. So who wants to go first? Can you please identify yourself? Oh, hi, Roman. Roman Gray. Um, I love this panel. This is fantastic. What a great way to start. It's lovely to see you all. It's lovely to get so many different complementary perspectives on a really important dimension. I think the one question I had is for everybody, and I hope you all might have some thoughts, but uh, you know, the swap line aspect to me has been increasingly part of the way that I understand this whole story and understand the kind of post Bretton Woods, what's the new kind of baseline. But we've been talking a lot about the dollar side of things. And at least to me, part of my version of the story is that there's this sort of parallel Chinese swap line kind of framework building over time as well. And I'm wondering in the context of developing countries and as we're seeing this, is there is there a dynamic of playing the two off each other? Is there something to be gained from that? If we're thinking about this, not just in terms of money flows, but power and sort of broader networks of real resources, if you're finding yourself in the middle, you know, the non-aligned movement of version of this story, is there... Is there much to be gained there? Is it, is it sort of you're still negotiating against bigger powers or is there some way of potentially capturing some of the value of, of those two groups both wanting to essentially compete for? Yes. We would collect more questions. So. Yes. Yes, Eric Simon here. I have uh, questions. Uh, one to Karina um, for the court. Uh, and what do you have in mind in terms of where where the court would be located and what kind of jurisdiction it would have. If we go back, for example, the Argentinian case, basically all that was uh, basically gone through U.S. courts, and they basically heavily favored U.S. financial institutions. So, is there a way for the court that has uh, back to power and has a, a way to um, be more fair in its evaluation of, of the needs of the, the debtors and how, how would you structure that work. Uh, the other question I have is if we move away from money, as I was emphasizing, um, what about the role of uh, bilateral trade and developing that as a way to avoid the use of money in the first place to develop trade in money? For the Christians' comments, again. Yeah. Um, what are what are the incentives or the interests that are sta or standing in the way of the needed reform or better reforms? Uh, what wh who is who is standing in the way besides just being benighted and not having 
you know, the right perspective, but what, what interest would be against uh, a positive movement in this area? Okay. We'll take one more before we let the guest. Hi, Brandon and Stennis. Um, I, uh, even if, to mobilize real resources, you need to have, you know, put some, some kind of finance, you need to have money that finance then you, you know, MMT shows us that we can sort of produce that. But whether you produce that currency, like you're either selling bond, like uh, obtaining foreign exchange by selling bonds or you're selling sovereign domestic currency bonds to the private market um, or to other entities, if you sell that or you're doing like monetary finance, selling those bonds to um, the central bank. Um, and so, I don't know, how, how do we think about how we actually obtain that finance in order to mobilize uh, those, those real resources when there are significant constraints on the ability to sell domestic debt to the private market? Thank you. Uh, I'd love, like to give uh, the panelists a chance to respond now. And uh, if you can invite Dongo, if you'd like to <laughs> comment on. I speak from here. Can you... Should I just comment on the thought line um, question, Rohan, which is that um, the first uh, question? Let's see if he wants to okay, respond sure. first. Uh, oh, I don't know. I, you can, hear, can you hear me? Can you? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Would you like to respond? Yeah, I could respond on the interest, uh, <laughs> you know, trying to stop, you know, genuine international reforms. Okay. There has been this this question. In fact, recently there was this discussion about IMF quota and voting rights reform. And the uh, US they said, well, uh, we would not uh, let the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and especially China, have a uh, you know voting rights and quota that would reflect China's economic weight. And you could see that well, uh, the I mean the global North countries, I mean Japan, the US, and the EU are opposed, you know, to any uh, democratic change within the Bretton Woods system. The other thing is, for example, when it comes to taxing the transnational corporations, there have been fights led by African nations uh, from the African Union. Uh, but this has been opposed by the U.S. and the global North countries. When you see, for example, the voting, uh, uh, the voting patterns, you would clearly see the West the global North against the rest. That, that, is, that is clear. So that's why I'm not too uh, optimistic about any genuine reform of the international financial system or tax system. That's why I'm trying to think what we could do within the, this system of, you know, this functional system with many dependencies, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Um, would like to go, Mona, would you like to go first? Yeah. Uh, just in terms of the swap lines, I, I think the volume is just way smaller. So I think China's strategy has been to build up with the RI and it's expanding that recently, right? The hundred billion more. Um, but it's slowly that I think we're seeing the evolution of uh, the Chinese swap line. Now it has the alternative China does to the SWIFT network, which is the SIPS uh, uh, goes through a hundred different countries. But again, in terms of volume, it's rather small. Uh, will that become a new side of geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, struggle? Probably. Uh, I know that China deposited 2.1 billion in uh, Pakistan's uh, foreign exchange. So it's using that, right, with certain players. I don't think it's as developed uh, as as the United States, the Federal Reserves. Uh, I think, yeah, I really think we're far, far from that. So. Are we uh, yeah. answering one question at a time? So You can respond to whichever ones you I mean, those one was specifically addressed, I think, to Kari or and to you too. It was very yeah. question I think. Right. Do you want to comment on, on the swap lines? No. Okay, so I'll comment on that. <laughs> I don't know any 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 other. <laughs> uh, no, on the on the swap lines. I think um, yeah, I agree with that. The scale, yes, but there is. I think there is a notable feature there. Uh, like they are longer term. It's not a short term. You know, the 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 the, the window for the repurchase of the of the currency is longer term. So it's like some of them are like two, three years. So that supports China's kind of productive kind of uh, aspirations, you know, connected to the BRI, I, I believe, and like 
So it's interesting to see that that difference. So it's more entangled. Yes, it's entangled in the same way that the swap lines support the financial, you know, uh, the, 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 the the rather financialized kind of nature of US uh, um, activity, right? The banking, the banks and so on. So it's interesting to see that it's a longer term kind of repurchase uh, period. Uh, some, you know, researchers have uh, noted, I, 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 it's a paper that has, has uh, several co-authors, I don't, um, yeah, sorry for not attributing that. Well, they said this is a, a sort of a lender of last resort uh, kind of uh, um, mechanism. Um, I think it's kind of, we need to kind of um, be kind of cautious about uh, kind of saying, you know, uh, thinking about that because, uh, of course, it, it does support the liquidity needs of, of those uh, jurisdictions and states. So, but from an, an alignment perspective, picking up on what you said, I think, uh, you know, a, a key concept of non alignment, at least, uh, uh, you know, in certain traditions, is thinking about autonomy, right? So, how important it is to ensure the the highest level of autonomy you can possibly have at the periphery, and that be, and that involves some hedging and some having some a diversification of liquidity sources. Um, and in that sense, I think it's it, it's it's very you know it it, it can work uh, quite a lot. Uh, and let's just think about the Argentina case because Argentina has. Uh, you know, had, uh, has very significant, has a huge uh, burden of external debt, and now the IMF is the is the is the, ah. is the most notable burden in terms of repayment. Uh, you know, the, the kind of balance of payments uh, pressures, and Argentina had to make a payment. They had simply no resources to you know in the in the in the foreign reserves or in the, in the central bank actually. To make that payment, and they relied on Chinese, the Chinese swap line to make a payment to the IMF, like a like a very quick kind of loan, you know, the short term uh, loan to make that payment. Also on Qatari, a Qatari loan, and uh, and they and the CAF, the the Latin American fund, uh, uh, yeah, kind of having translation problems here, uh, but. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to see how that that has it's kind of replacing the IMF at least in the specific situation of Argentina as a lender of last resort. They are actually using the Chinese swap line to repay the I to to make that payment, kind of in a very creative way. Let's put it like that. So I think diversification here is important. I don't know, you know, the, the scale, yes, of course, but it gives you some maneuver that are, otherwise it, it, you wouldn't. I think uh, Eric's questions. Yeah, good. It's okay. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think that this um, this elephant in the room for me is really this, this is finance easy to gather or is it difficult to get? I think that that question really isn't solved, and it's obviously at the heart of the debate about MMT in the global south. So, I mean, swap lines operate as financing, as you just said, in a way, right? Repayments of debt that the IMF has imposed. Um, in the context of uh, Senegal, for example, within the France CFR Union, if we follow a domestic resource mobilization strategy, uh, I think it would be worthwhile to really look into, into, into the practice of parallel currencies and how they have worked in the past and whether that could be useful ideas today. Because I think from the conceptual framework of MMT, for all domestically available resources, in theory, there shouldn't be any problem to pay with these parallel IIUs for that particular sector of the domestic food economy. So I think that would be definitely something to... To, to think through and, and, and operationalize policy-wise. In terms of Eric's question of bilateral trade, um, that sounds a bit like barter, right? And barter potentially always works, but I think there's also this basic Marxist insight that you know that, that you need a, a third. That's what made money necessary in a way to make different commodities comparable in a way. So I think we wouldn't get out of a modern money economy just by going back to barter somehow it would reimpose itself because we would have to compare these different bilateral trade agreements. But I totally agree with the overall implicit thrust of this idea that um, 
And I think Don will argue something similar that a lot more could be done by, by fostering parallel trade relationships that are not with Europe or with the US strategically. And I think that is going on. I mean, uh, relating to Mona's work on sanctions and all that, I mean, Russia, China, and we've, we've been reading about more like southern trade channels and increase of trade deals. And it's a very obvious choice that will fundamentally transform, I think, policy space of, of countries in the global south and also constitute some kind of diversification in the in the both in the trade and in the financial uh, realm. And to your question about how to get that finance, we have euro bonds, we have uh, domestic currency bonds, and we have monetary financing. I think we also have um, newly founded IOUs, uh, parallel currencies, in theory, that we could put to work. But that's sort of a little bit out of the box, but I think would be sort of a, in my reading, I'm not a huge MMT expert, a distinct possibility that would not rely on this classic established means of manipulation and would be a genuinely public forum. Can I answer Eric's question? I mean, I'm a bit, I'm a bit chaotic here, sorry. I should have. No, that's what? fine. We like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, the, on the court uh, thing, I, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it, it's not, uh, I don't have, you know, kind of a quick answer or easy answer to that. Um, I, I do um, appreciate, yeah, there is power involved here. Uh, but um, uh, and that connects with the que your question about what interest and in the way of positive reforms. Because uh, my, my my crucial point, I think, to answer both questions is what I see is there is a kind of privatization of how we see sovereign debt in terms of you know it's a commercial type of uh, it's it, it, you know since the for decades now since the seventies it's a, you know it's seen as a commercial instrument in the, you waive sovereign immunity so the state behaves as a commercial entity raising money in the market as uh, like any other uh, private actor uh, and the laws that apply to that are commercial law commercial courts will hear that you know if, if you sue a state a bondholder sue the state it's a commercial court so we see a move towards. Uh, Private law, uh, commercial law, in in the in governing those transactions. But then, when you when you have a sovereign debt crisis, when you have a problem, then you don't apply the the the, the standard, you know, the legal principles that apply to the restructuring. So, it, as I mentioned before, it's a standard standard laws of capitalism. You you could have uh, you know a, a sovereign debt restructuring plan, just like. It, it exists in Chapter 11 of, of uh, UK of the US uh, Bankruptcy Code, or uh, that's the Companies Act in the UK, uh, where you have pre-insolvency proceedings, meaning you, the, the the company has some flexibility to put together a plan, and the court will evaluate the commercial reasonableness of the offer, and they will um, direct the the proceedings. So I think. Uh, yes, the, you know, there is a politicization and kind of a, a strong geopolitical interest involved in when you have a problem. It's imposing that that lack of flexibility, right? The rigidity in the law if you have a problem. We need flexibility in the law when you have a problem. And I, I, I um, so where the court will be located, I don't know. But the principles here already exist. That's what I would like to kind of stress to the uh, the audience. So uh, the the, 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 the there is the, there is a lot uh, of uh, expertise and uh, and principles and 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 decades of try trial and error in commercial practice that could inform the decision making processes here of those courts where we could have uh, some participation of uh, like UN bodies like UNCTAD uh, uh, to to understand from a comparative law perspective how this could work, but we are not uh, starting from scratch, definitely. I think if we if we are using private law to uh, create this debt, we should use it to solve the problems that come associated with when they have, they have a debt crisis. So interest that stand in the way, I think it's basically uh, the, the the idea that this, uh, the idea that creditors want to hold the power, you know, want to hold the key when you have a problem, but that is, but that is creating. Uh, it, it it creates problems, uh, just like it used to when we, we when we had no insolvency or pre-insolvency mechanisms in private law, uh, like slavery. You know, the debtor slavery. But we still have that at a at a state level. 
uh, when you have a sovereign debt crisis, but just like private pe people used to have in the past. Okay, we have uh, some more time for uh, a few more questions or comments or observations. Yes. Um, CP, would you like to go first? No, let me. I'll, I'll oh, I didn't see the hand there. I'm sorry. Pavlina was blocking you. I could see you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, please go first. Yeah. This is a, a, a very important theme uh, that popped in and out of uh, the presentations was the link between economic sovereignty that we're discussing about the economic sovereignty and the nature of political and economic regime. So, uh, uh, to be more specific in, in Kai's presentation, you say earnest efforts, but you could actually take that approach because Senegal has among the best governments, domestic government structures, no corruption, um, in, around in independence of the judiciary. So there is the nature of a of, of political regime that allows you to make that argument. So it seems to be that when, when we see these discre um, uh, asymmetries in power that the global uh, economic um, uh, political economy uh, hangs on, they are also enabled by uh, what uh, in some strands of uh, dependency theories would, would uh, point to um, kind of the complicity between uh, core and periphery elites in their joint interest in extracting resources and weakening those societies. So my appeal is just not to bracket the issue of the type of political economic regime when we discuss uh, economic sovereignty. Um, CP, yeah. would you like to <laughs> No, this is the Lindongo and the Kai. Uh, the question for me, you know, when you speak of real resources being more important, then both of you were looking at primary commodity exports. And the point about, about exports is that the transformation of domestic currency into foreign currency is easy because it's an exportable good, it's a tradable good. But if you look at what international inequality had generated as part of development, which I was concerned, was an inability of these countries to actually diversify into manufacturing. Because the point was, if you looked at after the Second World War, anywhere between 80 to 100 percent of the domestic consumption and investment of, of, of manufactured commodities was important. I mean, you didn't have you didn't have a manufacturing sector except for one or two countries, and that even textiles and so on. So, so, so if you look at it that way, basically the real resource you're talking about is your ability to be able to diversify into manufacturing, which is where your dependence on the international market is full. You cannot make the transformation. You need the foreign exchange. And if you if you if you continue to depend on primary commodity exports, and every developing country begins to depend on primary commodity exports, the structure was set over this earlier. Then that is actually going to result in a collapse in international market prices. The terms of trade shift against the WTO. So. While, while, I, while I like the idea of actually that the issue is real resources, the problem is that the real resources we are talking about is to diversify into areas which in which there is no history and in which the technology is controlled by these transnational firms who want to tax. So I, I'm just wondering that, you know, whether it, it becomes easier if we just focus on tradable commodities, forgetting so that those tradables, other than oil exporting countries maybe, uh, are actually primary commodities which uh, are they losing any of which I should pay? Sorry. Uh, any other questions or comments before we let the panelists respond? No. Okay, so I'd like to give a, a look. Um, can Dogu the first chance to respond since uh, uh, CP's question was focused? To, and I think uh, the question right there also is relevant yes. to Dogu's uh, remarks. So, Indugu, would you like to go first? And before I give Kai the chance to respond. Okay. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much for, for these questions. I'm not sure to have well understood uh, Shandu's question. Uh, but uh, my idea is that it's not that uh, you are a commodity dependent country uh, on export side that you must be in a debt crisis. No, because there are countries who, who are that are structurally rich. I could give the example of Libya. I mean, Libya under Hadafi, the oil sector was a national oil sector. So the country was able 
to uh, attract significant, you know, dollar deposits. And at what point it was converted into gold, but that's another story. So that means that uh, countries that are structurally commodity rich, they need not be in debt distress because they need not issue debt in foreign currency. Now, whether they, man they uh, manage to diversify into manufacturing high value added sectors, that's another thing. My, my point of view is that in Africa, you have many rich countries. I mean, uh, countries like Gabon who are, uh, that have, you know, very little population, Equatorial Guinea, these countries should be at least like Libya and Hadafi or Saudi Arabia to some extent. So they should not be in debt crisis. And this is not something uh, linked with the international monetary system, despite the defects, but just that the resources are not used the way, the domestic resources, the, the way they, they should be. But uh, most of us, you know, uh, would recommend that, well, you have to have industrial policy to diversify, etc. But most of African countries are structurally resource rich, but they have not been using that, you know, to, to develop their economy and to, uh, and to, and to create prosperity for the population. Ab about the Senegal and the CFA franc, the thing is, there is an institutional choice. In the West African countries of the CFA franc, the institutional choice is that these countries could grow only through financial dependency. Why? Because, uh, during the last six decades, they have a chronic uh, trade and current account deficits, except for one country, uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And when you have structural current account deficits, and at the same time, you have a peg against the French currency for six decades, that can't work. The only thing you could do is just to increase financial dependencies through bringing more debt in foreign currency or more, de uh, or more foreign debt investment in extractive sectors. That's the only way these countries could grow. And this pattern of growth does not create prosperity. And the best sign for that is that I could give an anecdote. I was traveling to Morocco, uh, I mean, some weeks ago. Uh, and the plane I took, uh, there were something like 400 people and half of it was Senegalese people, less than 25 years, where they were heading to, to the US, through Nicaragua. That was the first time I saw them I, because I, I read some stories. All these young people, they say, we have no future here despite the rates of economic growth, 6% per annum before, you know, COVID-19. And they were saying, well, we have to go to Nicaragua. And from there, we expect to reach the U.S. by, you know, crossing many borders. And when I saw economists saying we have to wait for, you know, significant reform of the international financial system, uh, you can't do the job guarantee, etc. So I say, well, I mean, this is a defeat for the, for the progressive because people are saying nothing could be done. And we have uh, numbers, but that are not uh, significant for the for for the people. And to some extent, these are policy choices made domestically. And that's why I think it's important to focus, uh, you know, on you know things that could be done. You know, even you know uh, taking into account the asymmetries and the num numerous defaults of the international economic and monetary system. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh... I'd like to give the floor now to Kai, if you can keep your remarks brief. So yeah, you thank you. Yeah, thank just you. Bert, I mean, hi, Dom, greetings to Dakar. <laughs> yeah, to just to stress that, um, so his piece that he published uh, for EDI actually was you know, on the job guarantee. It goes, I think, the furthest in sort of really making it specific how that could look uh, to implement a job guarantee that Pavlina sort of has been working on as leading that always could look in, a, in Senegal, for example. But what I think is is not developed in that paper is is the question of financing it. I mean, Donga, as far as I understand your piece, uh, you say it's rather unproblematic because it's cheap. It could be done. Um, yeah. So I think for me it would be interesting to also develop further this this monetary and financial side of what this MMT in the global south debate um, could mean. And to do to you, Chandru. Um, yeah, I mean, there is a there's sort of a bias in the presentation of my my uh, the presentation I did because I was interested in what did they achieve in terms of diversifying their exports. But I think in terms of narrative, it would make much more sense to focus on what domestic resources they already have and how this could be sort of upscaled into in, in what way. And I, I think realistically, we also have to think more more openly about relative forms of delinking and what kind of manufacturing and what kind of uh, industrialization we we think is useful, right? And that is obviously a choice to be made by by the countries concerned. But I mean, the the, the catching up idea was tried for sixteen years and only worked in like huge uh, economies like China and India to some degree. Uh, but for small landlocked countries, I think maybe new new ways have to be found. 
without saying industrialization is not for everybody. But I think this, this what you're arguing is we, we need manufacturing that has to be the natural way. Um, maybe at least that needs to be nuanced and complemented in the face of the current situation uh, where we have sort of uh, trading blocks coming up, where, which offers opportunities for regional complementarities to be developed strategically, which is something that, that Fadal is always pushing which I think because of the colonial infrastructure hasn't really been tried. We only have roads and, 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 and trainways leading to the ports instead of between countries. Yeah, I think regional complementarities, maybe also regional attempts at manufacturing, but not necessarily everything in the national container. Yeah. Okay, yeah, may I ask you all to give a hand to our panelists?